Hey, today is September 4th, 2017, and you're listening to Human Factors Cast, episode 56. Today we'll talk about robot caretakers for the elderly, Alexa and Cortana are playing nice now, and you'll find out exactly how we feel about the headphone jack. Yeah, that 3.5 millimeter one that you have on every phone, except for Apple for some reason. Anyway, Human Factors Cast starts right now. Let's do it. Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Human Factors Cast. I'm your host, Nick Rome, joined today by my Mr. Caretaker over there, Mr. Blake Arnsdorf. Oh, Mr. Caretaker, indeed. And sorry for anybody that might be able to hear Karlov going on in the background. Oh, I hear it. I hear it. What's going on? Is there a... It. Hang on, just let's see if we can hear. Yeah, I totally hear it. Yeah. Oh, uh, the sweet sounds of the city. But yeah, it's. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what's going on. It just typically happens. But anyway, Nick, how are you? Oh man, I am good. I am good. I had a really busy weekend. Um, doing uh, so. So just to give our listeners some context here, I am a grown adult, and uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm just giving. Are you them, sure. Yes, I am, and uh, I spent this weekend. Looking for Star Wars toys. Okay, explain. What do you mean? <laughs> so, uh, Star Wars fans have this thing uh, that happens every year or so uh, in September. It's usually the first Friday of September. They call it Force Friday, and uh, it's when all the retailers put out all the cool stuff on on their shelves. Right, this is where that B- that Sphero BB-8 came from. This is, you know, they have this big push, this big marketing push before the movies come out. And uh, sometimes they'll have like these little events. Uh, anyway, I, w- I was out there. I was looking for toys. I surprisingly, you want to guess how much money I spent this year? Oh, uh, I'd say like what fifty bucks, maybe. Man, you are that's that's a little high. I actually spent only twenty bucks on Force Friday this year compared to my hundred fifty last year. So big difference. But anyway, I got to talk to you, man. There's this thing. Uh, there. Okay, so augmented reality. We know my interest in that and it's pretty cool stuff i uh there's this little game uh or i guess it was like a little mini event where you actually go out to these retailers and they have they have images of characters from the new movie coming up and it's kind of like a collectible game you go up and scan the code and um it, but the codes are embedded into the images so you can't actually tell that they're co i mean i can because i know it is but for kids you know they, they kind of built it into the artwork so that way you can't really distinguish what it's not like a typical qr code it's kind of like these dots that are arranged in a certain pattern kind of looks like a splatter oh fo- yeah i saw some of this like on the target that's near me yeah it had a it had like just picture or I guess like giant stickers of some of the characters from the stories. You got it, yeah. And so you you go up to it with your Star Wars app and you just scan it and you get these little collectibles. And it's really cool because uh, you know it projects them into your phone and you can walk around them. And as long as the pictures in in view, and I mean it's it's pretty standard as far as AR technology goes. But I mean it's it's pretty cool that they're starting to incorporate this stuff into marketing pushes and making it more accessible. All you need is the Star Wars app, right? And you just download this thing, and it uses your camera, and boom, it's there. It was it was a pretty cool thing. That is a pretty epic marketing experience for sure. That's really awesome. So I want to bring up two other things. I know we have a lot of banter to talk about, I see here. Uh, I want to bring up one more thing with Star Wars, and then I'll ask you how you're doing. But there's this thing this year, uh, this new technology from Hasbro. Uh, I don't... Okay, Blake, do you remember when The Phantom Menace came out? There was this uh, sort of technology called uh, ComTech, and it's it had these little chips that came with the action figures, and you'd put it on this ComTech thing, and it used NFC, which was actually really interesting that it was able to use nfc at the time right this was this was late 90s i think when um when the phantom menace came out and so uh yeah so was this like playing the voices of the characters that belong to the chip you got it yeah so it came yeah. with these little chips and you put it on the comtech reader and uh yeah it was 99 when this came out and nfc was such a it was a new piece of technology and so um They've they've kind of updated, so they they came back again, and they're they're coming out with this thing called Force Link, and it's basically like this this bracelet that cuts off your circulation if you're a grown adult like I am, and uh, 
<laughs> these action figures, I, I, they come with chips, right? And uh, it's the same kind of concept, except for now it's on your arm and it's embedded into your play. And I, I, I don't have any hands-on experience with this, but uh, it looks like you can kind of make them say whatever you want. So it's enhancing... Um, sort of this uh this experience for children when they play like they no longer have to use their imaginations they're actually getting lines from the movie directly on their arm as their action fa- like i thought it was pretty cool i oh I that's kind of incredible yeah because now it's almost bringing whatever they are, are imagining to life just that a little bit more because it's like it's uh rooted in actual physical reality versus just their minds yeah you got it and uh i'm, I'm looking up details now to see if um there's any uh, information on this yeah it looks like you just hold it up to the action figure and the sh- and the ships i think the ships actually have the chips built in which is pretty cool and they you know make the sounds of the uh of the the ships and stuff and the weapons and man it all seems really cool and i i wish i was growing up with these toys because man is this is this a cool thing this is such a yeah. cool thing i might have to uh I might have to be that grown adult that goes and buys these toys because uh, these are pretty cool. Anyway, man, what's uh, what's up with you? Well, those do sound awesome. So I'll keep it in line with some of the Star Wars news, right? So I'm big into functional uh, <laughs> fitness equipment. And there's a company called Onnit that has released in the past like themed equipment through like Marvel or um, around other movies. And finally, they've done a Star Wars line. So this includes like kettlebells that are shaped like Boba Fett's head. Um, a yoga mat with Han Solo on it, and some other types of designs. But even though this is awesome and I'm a big Star Wars fan, the first thing I thought of was, like, okay, this is a great set of designs, and you're doing it just in time because movies come out in a few months, but are they actually functional? And I watched a bunch of videos to actually get a sense of how they look and what it looks like when people use them, and I just wanted to shout out that they did a great job, like, making these designs not only look awesome but still be usable in terms of uh as fitness equipment so they're not just like set pieces for your house you can actually take them out and use them at the gym yeah i actually saw one of these earlier uh it looks like a darth vader head kettlebell right <laughs> darth vader yeah, uh, helmet. Yeah, yeah 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 oh man so i thought th- i thought that was really cool especially since force friday was over the uh, last weekend and all that kind of good stuff Oh, yeah, yeah. They've been coming out with a ton of stuff. But, yeah, it, it's exciting. What is this? Han Solo yoga mat. <laughs> yes, that thing looks so cool. I was I was too hype on that. Uh, but so the other thing that I had kind of come up on Friday Friday morning, I was in a kind of just like a telecon that I have every like couple of weeks about planning for a specific event that's coming up called World Usability Day. And something that I hadn't really thought of was kind of how people are – the expected audience you're going to have is going to experience a specific topic that you want to do. Hey, Blake, really so quick. Sh- really quick. Do yeah. you want to plug World Usability Day? Is there any events that our listeners can attend? Uh, yeah. So in it's, I'm still working to put some of the details together of where, where the actual venue will be. But in L.A. on November 7th, which is a Thursday, um, UXPA L.A. will hold their World Usability Day event, which is all centered around... Uh, design and inclusion in design. Okay, cool. And uh, maybe maybe we get a list together and uh, present it next week for our listeners. November 7th, you said, right? So they still got some time? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Plenty of time. We haven't even released when the actual, uh, what the venue is going to be yet. So it's still early planning stages. Excellent. We'll, we'll, we'll keep our listeners up to date on that. And hopefully, hopefully we'll see a few of you there. Uh, all right. So anyway, keep, keep going. I, I totally interrupted your flow. So no, no, no. it's all good. <laughs> So what I thought was interesting is, so for World Usability Day, they come up with a theme. This year it's inclusion, and there's a long list of kind of ways you could tackle inclusion, right? And a big one for inclusive design is definitely accessibility. So making technology more accessible for people that can't access it normally if they have some sort of disability or what have you. Um, But something else that was on the list was of course what's big in the news especially from a technology perspective is talking about ai and designing for inclusion with uh, artificial intelligence systems so so we had to battle with because we we use these events to try and make money for our nonprofit, so we can keep throwing events throughout the year that are free to the people that come so how do you how do we gauge what people are going to be more likely to come and see are they going to come see something about accessibility which 
I didn't know this, but uh, particularly in the LA area has connotations to mean only things about like handicapped people and not really having anything to do with technology versus something that's really big in the zeitgeist now, which is AI, which is just a, it's a tough decision to have to make or think about like what you're presenting towards your audience and how they're going to receive it, how likely they are to come to your event. That's interesting. So you're almost talking about the meta uh, sort of information um, around what you present and uh, trying to figure out the UX, essentially, of what's going to draw people in, right? Yeah, because it's, it's one thing to put on like a great event that gives out a lot of good information, but at the same time, you have to play towards what's going on with the audience in your community. Uh, so it's a, it's a tricky balance, right? Because I'm a big proponent of, proponent of accessibility, and when I saw that kind of like in the list of topics to talk about, I was really excited about it. But then, then again, we have to think about the balance between what are we going to get or what are people that come to this event going to get the most bang for their buck out of and what are they going to learn the most about and what's appealing to them. And right now, I think there's other topics that might be more appealing. Right, right. Well, uh, that, I mean, hopefully it, you hit the nail on the head and, and pick the right ones. But I guess that's part of the draw, right? I mean, some people will come for some things and it's uh, it's kind of like a specialized um convention uh for for our, our nerdy listeners right it's it's the difference between going to star wars celebration just star wars all day every day today uh it's, it's the difference between going to star wars celebration and going to you know comic-con right where comic-con is a, a mix of everything where star wars celebration is very concentrated and and you're trying it sounds like you're trying to get this broad range of topics kind of like the ux equivalent of comic-con where you have a bunch of variety of different topics um and you almost want to you you almost want to bring people in uh from from a variety of different areas but still make it easily accessible enough to sort of entice just the average goer is that is that an is that an accurate assessment there Exactly, yeah, because we want to bridge the gap between like having specific sessions, I guess, that are targeted towards maybe either leadership or people specifically maybe in the AI field to also having like a broad stroke, kind of like Comic-Con would, where you can go and see multiple talks or workshops about multiple events or multiple topics. So it's it's a fine line between like what are people interested in and how much can we dedicate the entire day to this type of stuff. So it's just a, another interesting conundrum when it comes to I don't know, just design in general. And this is, a, again, kind of abstracted from the digital space. So I just thought it was cool to talk about. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I have one more piece of banter that kind of plays into our first story. So have you have you seen any of Westworld? I have not. Okay, so do you, do you know the basic premise? Oh, uh, you know, I really, I have a very basic idea of what it's about, but... It, you can give a give the listeners a heads up if you want. Okay, so without spoiling anything, that don't worry. This is Westworld spoiler free, and the seasons have been out for a while, so I'm finally catching up. And Blake, from our little conversation we had before the show, it sounds like you're going to catch up soon too, which is great. We'll have a lot to talk about. But um, essentially, the premise behind this this uh, story is there are. Oh, geez, how do I say this without spoiling it? Uh, there are robots that inhabit this world, right? And um, they kind of interact with uh, the park goers. It's, think of it like Disneyland, but instead of Mickey Mouse running around and it's a human inside, it's a, it's a robot. And you can, you can do anything with these robots uh, from like quest lines to having sex with them to whatever it is, right? It's, it's Westworld. It's the wild, wild west. It's set there. Uh, and and uh, it... it skirts a lot of the topics that we cover on this show let me let me just leave it there um and it's a great segue because our first story is about robots so let's go ahead and get into <laughs> the human factors news this is the part of the show all about human factors news this can be anything from robots like i just said uh psychology ai whatever it is as long as it has to do with the field of human factors it is fair game blake what do we got up i already said it <laughs> blake tell us the story about robots <laughs> 
<laughs> oh man two excellent segues in the beginning of the show nick i love it all right so like nick said we're talking about robots so relying on a 300 pound bare-faced robots to help nursing home residents get out of bed in the morning is much more effective if those residents actually have a reason to get out of bed in the morning so elderly people dealing with social isolation and loneliness are at r- increased risk of a variety of ailments from cardiovascular disease and elevated blood pressure to even cognitive deterioration and infection in short, being o- old and alone can, in turn, kill you. But robots aren't just good for improving elder- elderly people's movement. They're surprisingly adept at keeping retirees socially, emotionally, and mentally engaged as well. So, Nick, this story was kind of, I don't know, insane to me, because I didn't realize there was that many robots that had been deployed kind of across the world it sounds like that are for specifically helping the elderly yeah oh oh, yeah yeah there there are quite a few of them and i was actually just as surprised as you were when you know they break down this list right they have carabot uh robo uh what is it osimo they got um densau elder care robot like some of these things there's there's so many of them in this article I'm trying to pick them out here from our show notes. And it's like, yeah, each one of them has their own kind of specialized task that they do. Um, but, I mean, there there are some general purpose ones like uh, like the Osimo as well. But I, I, I put this in our notes because it is sort of this, um, this transition from how to how, – or transition from not having robots in our lives to having robots in our lives and what kind of impact uh we have or they have on our lives right and man it's so hard to not tie this to westworld uh, <laughs> but like oh man uh but yeah no it, it, they're becoming a more prevalent part of our lives and we we really have to sort of incorporate them and what do they do for us as humans and the fact that you know they're almost like um companions to the elderly is really interesting, right? It's the same thing as, as getting like a, a a companion pet, a cat or a dog to keep uh, older people company, right? It, but they're robots and they, they do things. <laughs> they yeah, bring you I mean, drinks. That, so they talk about in the article, there was kind of like three categories of these robots. And I mean, it, it starts off with like serving and fetching. So getting people things, that makes sense, right? Especially if you have a more immobile uh, elderly adult that that robot's kind of helping take care with. Right. Um, but the biggest parts or the other categories that kind of shocked me, I guess, were, were like communicating and emotional support. Because when you think of, when I think of robots, I don't think of necessarily the emotional support angle at all. Uh, and this article really highlights in a big fashion that that's kind of part of the role that they're envisioning for robots to take is to be, especially in terms of there's a, there's like a specific robot that actually I didn't know was real. I had seen it in the show masters of none before. And it's a, uh, it's like a big fuzzy seal. I think it's called Paro. <laughs> and basically it's just like a, it's supposed to be just a companion for anybody. But in this case, they talk about it in terms of elderly people that you can pet and it can react to light and your touch and you talking to it. And they found that this particular robot, which is very simple, it sounds like is therapeutic for even depression. Um, so I thought that was really, I don't know, a, an amazing use of robots in this context. Cause I mean, we definitely think about them doing things for us, but actually providing emotional support. That's just kind of mind blowing. Oh, okay, okay. I'm I'm looking up the scene from Master of None because I I've seen the series and I remember Paro, but I didn't remember the scene. And it's uh yeah okay. I I just looked it up and now I remember. Um, but yeah, it, it, man, this is it's just so cool to me. It's so cool to me that we're able to do this and and the fact that you know these robots don't have to be overly complex right the seal that you just talked about paro it's it's very simplistic in its nature it's just a it's a it's it's basically just like a a pet right and or i mean not a it's pet. basically like a reactive stuffed animal is really yeah. what it is it's yeah and i mean you know the the part that gets to me right and and this isn't even mentioned in the article but there are implications outside of the elderly, right? We are indoctrinating our children and younger generations to interact with robots. Furbies uh, come to mind. Um, some of these 
even robotic, like I remember a robotic Pikachu from a couple years ago, right? We are sort of building these robots to interact with children. And uh, I mean, I mean, there are several others on the market as well, but how will the relationship change when these generations become older and uh, have to interact with them as well? Is it going to have the same effect when they're older? I mean, I'd imagine the technology will get more sophisticated as time goes on and, um, you know, they'll require almost uh, another level of companionship with these robots. But yeah, it, it's it's interesting to think about the future implications of this and, and where it could go, right? Well, yeah, because there's there's two like really big perspectives in this article, and I mean, um, so one of one of the robots they mention is Micro, and it's a it's fashioned after just a dog, right? So it can do your basic functions of okay, getting you pills or general companionship, but also this this whole thing connects into like an ecosystem that would be within an elderly person's house if they lived alone. So it's basically a smart house with this companion that can act as your own in-home physician, kind of checking on you and having you react to it in order to know if it needs to contact somebody. And there's also, it also talks about like there's even cameras built in the entire house. So people could be watching you at all times. So there's that there's perspective of like big time integration of robots into people's lives. But even at the very end of the article, they bring up a point from, I guess, a specific, uh, doctor in relation to these kinds of issues because um, a lot of this is talking about how seniors become isolated in their older age and that kind of leads to depression or even cor- it can be correlated with more ailments and those kind of things but it's it's as if what are we doing here are we replacing people with robots which is going to impound really social isolation even more where you just form this relationship with a robot only or is it like like we're kind of going about here is it just going to change the way we interact with both people and robots as we get older the more they're integrated into our lives so it's a it's an interesting kind of like paradox between technology and like just human to human interaction yeah oh, man you need to watch Westworld you need to watch <laughs> you need to because <laughs> uh <laughs> and our listeners our listeners who have watched Westworld they know what I'm talking about here there's these issues are throughout the entire series like this is probably you know what the whole thing is about honestly but um no it's interesting that you say that they kind of integrate with these smart homes I wonder if you could ask Alexa or Cortana uh Hey, where you know, bring my robot to me or something, you know, whatever it is, bring the Paro to me, uh, Paro, come here or something, you know. Uh, speaking of that, what is our next story? See what I did there? Oh, what a oh. clean segue! All right, so talking a little bit about AI now. So while Google, Apple, and Samsung are competing to build the smartest do anything personal assistant assistant for your phone, Amazon and Microsoft have elected to take a different approach. They're working together rather than competing. What? So in a yeah I know right so in a joint announcement from both both companies the New York Times reported that Amazon and Microsoft have spent the last year integrating Cortana into Alexa's ecosystem and vice versa so in fact Jeff Bezos told the New York Times that he wants their his customers to have access to as many AIs as possible and that that would be what is best for them as a whole and Bezos believes that each digital assistant fills a particular niche that in the future, one should be able to route a user to the best AI for a specific question. So maybe Cortana in some instances, maybe Alexa and others. And further, according to Microsoft's press releases, this interoperability between the two AIs will be available later this year. So, Nick, I mean, I'm kind of shocked, one, that we're seeing companies work together because it seems like they like to silo from each other and be... It more in the competing realm, but I think it's a really smart move from Amazon and Microsoft, especially in the realm of trying to improve just AI in general. Yeah, I was uh, really shocked by this this uh, news, right? It's, it's rare that you see these big tech companies actually working together to sort of make their products and services interoperable, right? It's, so, so that was the first thing. And then I was like, okay, how does this work, right? And so the way it does work is you kind of have to you have to ask one of them to open the other and that to me is a is a little clunky right 
So you have to say, hey, Alexa, open Cortana and then open my Outlook or check my Outlook calendar, right? So that's that's one way you can interact with it. And then um, Cortana, open Alexa, order something from Amazon.com. It just seems clunky to me. And in the case of like a, uh, you know, an all always listening device, it, it seems like maybe the key word should be, you know, recognizable. Uh, the, the wake word should be either one of these, right? And And the wake word that... It's always listening for this wake word, and, and when you say a certain wake word, it puts it in a certain mode, right? So when you say Cortana and your Amazon Echo hears it and processes it, then it will automatically route you into the realm of the Windows stuff. And then when you say Alexa, it will automatically route you into the realm of Amazon's skill set, right? So for now, it's clunky, but it's a great sign that they are actually working together. Oh, yeah. I mean, I really think that the digital assistant like that fills a particular niche so in this case maybe let's think of cortana as being able to do a lot of things for microsoft if you use microsoft and then amazon for everything amazon i mean it makes a lot of sense to have them but i totally agree with you the way that they're trying to go about it at first crack which this is the first attempt i mean you gotta do what you gotta do um of having one open the other seems really clunky like i I truly agree with that and And i I see what you're saying about having the specific wake words for them but i would hope that the eventual goal for this is if it hears a user ask let's say um hey Hey, i want to check my email yeah that it it knows like okay i need to i need to have cortana do this or i just need to open this through microsoft um, not necessarily having to say like, "Hey, Alexa, open Cortana. Cortana, can you do this?" So it starts cutting down those like task, like kind of from a task analysis perspective, cuts out one extra step of like verbal processing that you'd have to do. Right. Uh, but again, this is I think it's great that they're working together, and it would be it would really be nice to see like all of the conglomerates work on this problem um, in the same space. Like even if they, if you have to figure out how to like keep things proprietarily separate, but I think these great big giants that are working on AI, especially like personal assistants, they would really benefit from, you know, being in a think tank together. Right. Yeah. And, you know, uh, the whole clunkiness of, you know, asking something else to do something for you, that's that's uh, prevalent right now even. So Alexa has skills that you can enable and you have to say, like, Alexa, open this skill. And then that skill has specific commands, right? Where uh, in a perfect world, it would just, you could just give it the commands from that skill. It, uh, you don't even have to put it in that mode, and it would understand what your intent was, right? But there's a lot of ambiguity around the English language and language just in general, right? And so... yeah. It's a real challenge, and so that's I think that's one way that the developers get around that ambiguity of saying, you know, hey, Alexa, play my music. Well, from which source? Do you want it from Pandora? Do you want it from Spotify? Do you want it from Amazon's music? Um, do you want it to play from your phone? Like, what what mode do you want me in, right? And there's no, I mean, there's no right way right now to set preferences. Um, you know, when you ask her to play something now, it just pulls from Amazon's library, but there are ways that you can access other libraries and it's, it's, um, it's pretty clunky, but it's, it's also, yeah, for something like this though, where you're asking it a a simple thing, like check my email where it's possible on one platform, but not possible on the other. it, It seems to me that it should just at the very least, um, just listen for that other wake word. Now, you were right in saying that this is this is great for these companies to come together. Now all we need is Apple and Google to <laughs> hop in. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we got Alexa, Cortana, Siri, and OK Google, and we're good to go. And we got everything there. Well, I, I think the, the desire there, too, would be to almost make just one ubiquitous assistant at that point if we could get them all to work together oh um, yeah I, I mean we I, I don't I don't think it's entirely out of the realm of possibility we might even have a third party thing that accesses all these different um, apis and web services right that that kind of routes it accordingly when you ask like let's say it's a it's a uh, it's a new service called Teddy right and you say hey Teddy um, check my email and it automatically knows to go to Google because that's your thing. 
uh, there. But you use Amazon for music and you use uh, Cortana for work stuff and you use, you know, and it automatically goes based on your preferences. And there's a lot of setup, sure, but it does it. Um, I mean, I don't think that's out of the realm of possibility. We we actually talked about something very similar in the realm of VR a couple of weeks ago, right? There's this uh, ubiquitous VR headset that's that's supposedly multi-platform, right? And I think that th- this whole sort of uh, interoperability and integration and uh, basically ubiquitous apps, I like those those excite me because when it's all consolidated, when you can just sort of access all this information from one platform that's the coolest oh yeah and i think it's i think it's a lot more possible than maybe it's being allowed to function right now because you, i know that a lot of apps are collecting usage data as you use them so i mean even from just your phone's perspective on data it collects on what you're doing it could make simple choices about like hey i use for instance for me hey siri give me directions to this place well it knows i use uh, Google Maps, so it would pick that one over another. I mean, there, there's ways to at least do it based off of what the data that we have now is. But I think, I think, or I really like your idea of let's get somebody that's like the third party observer that allows all these co- to connect together. Uh, that's I think that's really the way of the future. Hey Blake, you want to start a business with me? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> all right, let's do it. Uh, what do you what do you want to call the, well, Let's call the wake word Blake. And all then... right, <laughs> and we'll call it Nick the assistant. Yeah. Nick the Assistant, the Wake Words Blake. <laughs> <laughs> Most unusable AI ever. Nick, Nick, Nick. Damn it, it's not waking up. Oh, this is the Wake Words Blake. I don't know why. These were made by human factors people? This is awful. <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> All right, well, uh, do you have any other things to say about the uh, integration between Alexa and Cortana? I just think it's a it's a great first step. Hopefully, over the next like couple of years, we'll see less of the "Hey, you do this" and more of just like "Hey, I want to check my email." Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm hoping so too. All right, well, I just want to thank all of our friends over at Engadget, Gizmodo, Recode, and the Next Web for all of our stories this week. If you guys want to follow along, you can follow us all over social media. We post these stories as we find them, uh, as they come into our uh, sort of social circle and periphery we send these out to all of our social media so if you follow us out there you are getting a first look at what we're going to be talking about on the show every week uh okay blake what do we got up next all right so let's talk about a little bit about going to the doctor nah. so it may it may seem like facebook and her doctor's office don't have much in common but should they so take for argument's sake whenever facebook changes a future and everyone's up in arms about it with comments like Facebook, you're being creepy or I don't like this. Facebook itself will adapt and make changes based on its users or based on data it collects. Well, let's think about this in terms of going to a doctor. And if you have a bad experience, whatever it may be, how can you get that changed or even provide feedback about that experience? Right now, you don't really have an outlet for that. But there's a company called Forward that's trying to change some of that. So Forward charges users $150 per month for an all-you-can-use access to its resources. This includes ultimate unlimited doctor's visits, blood tests, and programs like anxiety reduction and weight loss reduction. But the emphasis here is on creating an app-like, an Apple store-like experience of friendliness and transparency, arming patients with the ability to track their medical history at any time from a companion app. And Nick, I think over the past few probably months we've seen a lot of talk about at kind of you know tracking your medical history from a companion app and how it's going to interplay with you actually going to the doctor along with like that whole personalized medicine ordeal and i think companies like this are starting to move in that direction um i i, I still wonder how this works because they talk a good about good amount about it in the article how like it kind of conflicts with insurance and things like that. But I think this is a cool step in a direction of more personalized healthcare from a technology perspective. Man, wouldn't it be cool if they integrated all this stuff where, uh, you know, it took data from your Fitbit and uh, analyzed your purchase history and saw that you went to McDonald's five times this month and, uh, you know, sort of made recommendations based on integrating all the... I'm just playing off what we just talked about. But, I mean, um, I think... I'm just so I'm imagining like you you go into the store and there's a bunch of geniuses there. Uh, 
<laughs> and they're like, what could we do for you today? And, you know, it's kind of like a... But I, I think um, the consolidation of data and, and it's, it's almost it's, it's almost seems like an Uber for, for uh, like an on-demand sort of health thing, right? And also... Uh, integrating that feedback. There's there's a lot of stuff going on here and I'm having a really hard time deconstructing it, right? So there's a lot of things going on. There's there's the feedback, there's all you can use sort of access to it and also this experience, right? Of uh, friendliness and transparency. Um, and so, and then there's also this whole piece with the companion app. So so how do you want to break this down, Blake? There's There's a lot of stuff going on here. Yeah, so I think like the biggest deal is kind of how it's how it changes how people view going to the doctor, right? So you, their real goal in terms of as a company is to encourage people to take a more proactive role in their health. So you know, tracking data that they get from various sources, and hopefully, like you just mentioned, it would be at some point, of course, not now, like an all encompassing, not just maybe how you're moving, but what you're putting in your body and that kind of stuff. Um, it, but also making like going to the doctor a pleasant experience, right? So it's not necessarily just this, I see you once a year for a short amount of time and we like right. kind of make decisions about my health based off of that. So I think real, I think the biggest part in terms of like importance is maybe how it's shifting the way people feel about healthcare. Um, the companion app, I, I mean, that's that's cool and everything, but I feel like, again, this is kind of forcing people to use a specific type of technology, right? Like, who knows if it actually integrates well with your Fitbit or integrates well with uh, tracking apps like MyFitnessPal for food. Well, look, um, so- I, here, here's here's my thoughts on that. I mean, some data is better than no data, right? If the doctor can see, oh, look, I see, you know, for a, a week or two in July, you started eating healthy and then stopped logging, um, you know, but I still have your Fitbit data uh, and it didn't look like you you stopped exercising. I can start to see a trend here, like something happened maybe. Um, and also with a companion app, can you, okay, so there's this app that I have right now called Google Survey Rewards and it uses your location data. Have you heard of this? Yeah, yeah, we talked about this on the show before. Oh, did we? Okay, yeah. So it, it uses your location data, pops up with a survey, right? And if you sort of used that model for this health companion app, right? Like, um, obviously, you'd have to instill a culture of honesty because people tend to lie when they go to the doctor. Yeah, I'm completely healthy. Uh, and that does them no good, right? But but if you were to sort of instill in them the uh, the more honest you are, the better information we have, and then the more you know the the better we can um, sort of uh, identify potential problems, or you know, uh, basically the more data we have on you, the better uh, for your health. Because if you're out at McDonald's and <laughs> You can just say like, hey, I see you at McDonald's, no judgment, right? And just say, hey, what are you having? Um, and then you could just answer a quick survey, right? Like I'm having this or, uh, you know, hey, we noticed that you're at your favorite place. Are you having your favorite meal? Um, and then that way they don't even have to specify. Yeah, it's a, it's a California burrito with uh, guacamole and cheese. You know, it's it's just, yeah, it's my favorite. That's it. And then just a quick yes, no check, right? Um because we're we're creatures of habit and when we go to places routinely we tend to order the same things and you know just a quick hey we noticed you're here what are you eating or even like hey we noticed you're at the gym and we noticed you were at the gym for an hour like it there's there's a lot of potential here for an app that does um that for this companion app you know in addition to this other piece and actually i i would actually argue with you that the companion app is is potentially the most important part of this. I think it is if you could actually get all those pieces of data to be integrated into it, yeah. So I, I, I don't think there's an issue there because you already have Google saying, oh, I noticed you were at TJ Maxx. How was, you know, how was your experience there? And you rate it. Did you spend anything with your credit card? No. Um, it has the location data and it can tell where you're at. And, uh, yeah, but do you think people are actually likely to want to give you that information if asked about it? It depends. See, it it all depend. It depends on uh, <laughs> on the perception of the app and whether or not it's like officially hospital sanctioned, and um, you know the the sort of 
culture behind how doctors and um, you know healthcare practitioners sort of advertise it, right? It's all about the advertisement. If you say, you know, we're going to collect all this data on you, and then we're going to be able to tell, things, like, no, don't don't approach it that way. Say, hey, you know, casually, there's this app, and the more information you know, we have, it, it's going to help you out because we have a better idea of your health. Right. And, um, yeah. And I mean, I, I see that as also calling out again, the importance of kind of like the shift in how we use that kind of data in healthcare. Cause it's not like it's integrated now that right. most doctors you go to will want to take a look at that data and use it in their diagnosis or even prognosis. Right. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it would be, I'm just, dude, I'm like on this kick right now of just integrating all this all this stuff, right? So we talked about the Amazon and Cortana thing. I'm just thinking now like, man, you could you could hook up anything to this. You could hook up your PlayStation account and oh, I noticed you were on PlayStation for 12 hours yesterday. Did you even move? Your location data said you were in the same spot all day. Like, uh but your Fitbit says you are working out. So, you know, were you working out while you're watching TV? I don't know. There's there's so many cool applications, and it's just a matter of. Do you want to start a business, Blake? Uh, I think this is the second <laughs> business of the show, but yes, I do. We are just giving people away ideas. You're welcome. You can write all royalty checks to Human Factors Cast uh, Patreon. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. So so uh, are, are there any other things that you want to talk about with this thing? Because I I don't want to say we beat this thing to death, but there is so much. There's so much here. That I don't know if we can cover it all in one show. No, there's so many implications to it, especially from data and changing how people think about healthcare. But it was a cool article. I was glad we were able to cover it. Yeah, I mean, that was a good find, man. You found that one um, and uh, asked me for my opinion. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. All right. Uh, what's up next? All right. So we're talking about the age old or year old conundrum <laughs> yeah. about should we kill the headphone jack? No. <laughs> All right. All right. Show's over. <laughs> Show's over. That's it for today, uh, that everyone. That was easy enough. Nick if you want to... Th- we're done. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Show's not over. Show's not over. Don't leave yet. All right, go. All right. So about a year ago, a trend began with phone makers removing headphone jacks from their smartphones. Many hoped that this would just be a passing fad, but it looks like we're still in danger of losing one of the most essential features of our phones that they offer today, and that is the headphone jack. So in an interview with Verge last year, Lay Echo's... President of R&D, Ying Jun, commented saying that ditching the headphone jack and going USB-C only didn't impact the manufacturing process or the gadget maker's ability to save space in its phone design. Okay, Nick, so I have a feeling you've got strong opinions about removing the headphone jack. Don't do it. Don't do it. Why? Well, it's been around forever. I mean, okay, so... Their whole argument is that it takes up less space, right? And that's not necessarily true. Uh, so, <laughs> I mean, you said Leiko's president said this, and and I think that's true. If if you know there there are other phone companies out there that say no, it, there's literally no space savings when you take away the headphone jack, uh, and it's something that. Headphones right now are fairly ubiquitous. You can plug them into any device except an iPhone. You need an adapter to plug into your iPhone that you then plug your supposedly ubiquitous device into, right? We're not at that stage yet where we can walk around with Bluetooth headphones and, you know, the battery doesn't die and they're powered by your skin or movement or whatever and it you just don't have to worry about it, right? I it's we're just not there yet maybe in the future sure but right now no let's get the technology there before we move on to this whole nother paradigm it's it's something completely different like the change from uh tape cassettes to cds that that was a change but what what was consistent across that change well the headphone jack right that didn't change it was just the way of playing the media so i <laughs> I don't know, man. Like, I, I just think we're not ready for it yet. Technology isn't there. Society isn't there. Yeah, <laughs> see, I don't, I don't know. I had kind of weird feelings about this article 
Um, because I recently did change over to an iPhone that does have the USB C drive or C jack. And this guy in this particular article said he didn't basically to say it lightly, just didn't want to test it because it, he just liked the eight millimeter jack so much or the three millimeter so much. And what I have found using the C or what is it? The USB C is that the sound quality is great. It's even better than some of the higher quality headphones that I have. That's fair. So, so I mean, I, I don't think that there's so many problems from that perspective. And the big, I mean, the biggest rub is like you're talking about with Bluetooth. You're the problem is you're basically draining batteries from two different places: your phone and the headphones themselves. And nobody wants to run around having to charge both with different, you know, plugs or whatever at all times. But I, honestly, man, I don't know. I mean. In terms of how we've changed how we listen to things, I mean, I'm, I listen to a lot more music on my phone than I used to listen to, and I, I mean, I can't even believe that's true. Uh, and I could, I would, would personally rather see them move to more high quality Bluetooth headphones. I mean, it's obviously going to take right. more time, but by removing jacks, I feel like that forces the pressure a little more on phone companies to make those pieces of technology more viable and even even more accessible to other people as far as like price barrier and stuff like that. So it, I don't know by doing this, it might drive that technology to get better quicker. Sure. I, I get that. So let me, let me take another third approach here. So let me, okay. So my problem with the USB C you listen to, you listen to music on your phone, right? Yes. And you use the USB C to plug in your headphones. Is that correct? I do. Okay, is that an adapter that you plug in your headphones to to the USB C, or does it is it just the USB C, or you? No, it's it's straight up USB C into the phone. Okay, so that's fine. Can you charge your phone while you listen to music? Uh, no, I'd have to have like a secondary charger for it. Right. Like if I had like a an external handheld charger, or if it could charge like at a station, but no, I can't charge without doing that. So that's my problem with it, right? There, the the at least on the Apple. Uh, platform you have to have that thing available and there's so much stuff that goes into that right like you can it's it's a communication port and and it's a charging port now if they set like let's okay let's say instead of just one USB C at the bottom it's two of them right so you have one to plug in your music to and one to charge with would that be that that to me would do it like that that would drive technology to get better while still providing the ubiquity of the USB-C and being able to charge and listen at the same time or transfer data and charge at the same time or, you know, whatever it is. If there's two of them down there, that's that's great. Or double charge at the same time. I don't know if the technology can do that, but damn, that would be cool. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I guess maybe their whole idea is moving away from just having the headphones non Bluetooth in general, because that is a giant problem of having to have basically extra pieces, like a sep- separate dongle to give you like a basically a splitter for having your headphones and it plugged in at the same time. Uh, so that does create like such a weird barrier to entry. And like like the guy in the article says, I'm likely to lose that kind of stuff. Like the only one that I do use is one that I use in my car and I only keep it in there for that very purpose. So I see, I see some of the pain points in it, but ultimately I think the, the seat, at least from the USB C it improved audio quality. Um, so I like it for that, but I, I do get a lot of the issues, especially with being able to do more than one thing. And also there's not a lot of options out there that exist um, other than Apple's headphones, I think, for this for this particular device. So now you're having to buy something extra to use higher quality headphones that aren't necessarily going to use the technology that's built into your phone. There's a lot of mess behind it. Yeah. Yeah, It's it really is a mess. And I, I tend to agree with the author that we're not ready to get rid of it. Um, but I tend to agree with you that it would drive technology in a, in a certain direction and potentially advance us in that regard. So tough call. What do you guys think? Write into the show and let us know. See what I did there? I was trying to get conversion. Oh, uh, yeah. How do they write into the show, Nick? Well, they can email us at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. They can visit our Facebook or Twitter, uh, tweet at us. Uh, we're at H Factors Podcast or whatever, you know, and just, just talk to us. Uh, <laughs> or, you know what? I think we're going to make uh, the... The uh, Slack, I think we're going to make that a Patreon 
only subscribers, so you can do that too. Um, <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, do you have any other closing thoughts on this USB-C 3.5 millimeter jack debacle? No, I, honestly, I like to hear what listeners have opinions about it. So if you do, tweet us with the hashtag HFCast and we'll take a look at it. Yeah, that'd be great. I, I don't I don't know. I think it's all right, kind of, but there's parts that I hate about it. I don't know. I'd like to get a little user feedback. Yeah, I think I think we're pretty split on this one. And that, that rarely happens, I think, with us. <laughs> all right, man, uh, let's go ahead and get to uh, It Came From Reddit. Now, this is the part of the show where we search all over Reddit to bring you topics that the community is talking about. This is our, part of our community outreach. Any subreddit's fair game, as long as it relates to the field of human factors and encourages discussion among the community. It's fair game. So, Blake, we got about 10 minutes. Do you think we can get through both of these? Why don't you go ahead and pick one to start with? I have two up here. Okay. Um let's go with the first one. I think we can get them both done. I think so too. Let's okay, let's tackle the first one here. Uh so this one was from the user experience subreddit and it was titled Newbie UX Designer Portfolio Questions. Uh oh god, Mega X Jack One. Oh, that's a cool name. Uh that is. <laughs> Hey guys, I'm sorry if this question has been asked before. I'm an aspiring UX designer and have been wanting to get into the field more. I've only started getting into UX about four months back, and since then, I've only done mild UX work at an internship in a consulting firm. My school's career fair is coming up, and I'd really like to come up with a portfolio before then. Hence, I have two questions that I hope I can get away with, uh, or that I can get help with. One, if I don't have any prior experience in UX and would like to do case studies on certain websites, what are the most important things I need to take note of? And two, I'd really like to show my work that I've done in my internship on my portfolio, which was a redesign of an internal sales program for the client. However, it is classified information. How should I go about displaying it? Okay, Blake, let's break this down. So number one, if I don't have any prior experience in UX and would like to do case studies on certain websites, uh, what is the most important things I need to take note of? Um, I would just be very explicit about the process you use. So really describe how you go about why you want it or why you're making certain redesign decisions about a website. Um, so uh, to do that, I would personally go look up through either Medium or just straight up online search. Look for you like really good UX portfolios that do like case study breakdowns of website redesigns and kind of use that as a guide uh, to help you get through it. Also, if you're going to make like redesign mockups, um, one thing that I think is really helpful is not to crowd your portfolio page with too much of um, too much of like all the mockups you ever made, just kind of show the steps you, you use. So if you're sketching, show sketching, if you do wireframes, show a wireframe or two, and then show kind of like final product, but allow people to have access or download the work that you've done, maybe through like a slide share or just like a Google slide. Dang it, Blake, you took my answer. Show the process. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's all comes down to, um, showing the process, but also showing the reason why, you feel the changes must be made, right? Like what is the sort of return on investment for the user? Why is this a more efficient way to organize information than what they have now? Uh, and chances are, if you're doing case studies on certain websites, these certain websites may or may not have already done this research. And so it's important to pick out ones that you think may be kind of low hanging fruit or, um, or maybe not, who knows? Uh, you know, it could be a tech giant. It could be Amazon for all I know. Maybe find a better way to display results other than faceted filtering or something. I don't, I don't know. Um, but the explanation of why it's good or better than the way it's laid out, right? Uh, you need to include the process and the rationale. That's a really good answer, Nick. Your answer was great too, Blake. <laughs> Woo! Should we answer number two? Let's get to number two. Now, I this is the reason why I picked this question, right? So let me remind our listeners of number two. I'd really like to show my work that I've done in my internship on my portfolio, which was a redesign of an internal sales program for the client. However, it is classified information. How should I go about displaying it? Now, I'm, I'm imagining this is uh, behind an NDA or something. Uh, it could be classified information if uh, they work for the U.S. government. Um but I, this is this is a real challenge, right? So, what information is classified in your example? 
And is there a way to just lorem ipsum that stuff and show the layout, show sort of a general idea of the content? So instead of saying, you know, the header is this classified, you can say it's placeholder text. Uh, or, you know, it, you can just replace that information. Is it the design itself that's classified? Because that's a little bit more tricky. Um, you you still might be able to get at the process and how you did it, but, you know, the, the, the work won't show the finished result. So it gets a little tricky if that's the case. But if you're just looking for, like, so this is a really weird example, and I actually saw this uh, a couple years ago. Um, someone was asking, you know, I've done UX for an adult website and I I obviously can't show my work to prospective employers. And, um, you know, someone provided the advice of just change the color scheme, change the name of the website and uh, say, you know, it was for browsing cat pictures or cat videos and, uh, you know, just replace the content. It... People may be able to deduce what it was, but you know it's all about the process and 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 showing the results of the process and kind of how you got to there, right? That's the most important part. So it's it's less about the information and more about what you do to get to that point. Yeah, Neil. Here's kind of two ways I would tackle this. So if I was you, I would take what I had done, put it together as if I was going to use this specific thing on my portfolio, I would take out the information that you have, whatever it is, the process, mock-ups, all that stuff. I would go try and set up a meeting with somebody who is above you, either a manager or whoever you can get at the company that would be able to tell you looking at it like, hey, you can't use these portions of it. This is what maybe you could replace it with so that you can still show the process of what you did. Um, but I would have a conversation with the people that you've worked with. Cause I, I get that it's classified either because of like Nick mentioned, like government classification or it's proprietary, uh, stuff that's to be released. Uh, but likely the people you worked with will help you kind of figure out how to go, especially if this was an internship and you're now moving on to go do other things. Like I'm sure they'd be more than happy to help you out. If that is not the case, and I know you were kind of on a limited time stretch, um, so you, you may only be able to do the website case studies for this round, but I would really encourage you to get on Reddit, and especially the specific subreddit we use. So that's uh, self.user experience. Hey, they, they are on user experience subreddit. Oh, yeah, yeah, Okay. So I was, <laughs> They're already there. They're already there. Yeah, but what I would do is I would look for posts when people are asking for help with their websites, so apps, saying, whatever. You're saying use the search function? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, I mean, I've... Uh, so through our Slack app, I've actually gotten to work with developers of apps because I wanted more portfolio pieces for myself that were more UI design um, than analysis and methods-driven stuff. So I actually used uh, an example that came up on the user experience Reddit said, Hey, I'll help you out with building your UI and they're potentially going to actually use my designs when they finish development. So I, that's another way to go is just check out Reddit. Look for people that want help. There you go. There's a couple other websites. I think 99 designs. Does that sound right? Uh, there's, there's a uh, basically sort of do me a favor websites uh, that you can, you can sort of outsource, not outsource your work, but, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? That you can you can do work for other people who are looking for a specific talent, right? So take a look for those. I think 99designs is one. I'm not sure. There's there's other freelance websites out there um, that may or may not take your design, and they they crowdsource solutions to their problems, and they pick one, and the one that got picked gets uh, gets money or whatever, you know. So so there are ways to do it. Um, but we got we got a couple minutes left here, and I want to get to this next question here. Do you have any other advice here for uh, what was her name, uh, Mega X Jack One? <laughs> uh, yeah, definitely do the ninety nine designs bit because it actually will. It's like you just said. It's it's basically a competition for a design, so you'll actually have to design something whether it gets used or not. So show the process with that. That's an easy way to go. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and get into this next one. This one's this one's an interesting one, and uh, I'm really curious on your take on it, Blake. Uh, this one is also from User Experience, and it was by Poofleberry. 
Love that name too. All right, so uh, the they write accepted to a UX boot camp, but not sure if I need it. Advice appreciated. Uh, they write. They go on to write. I've been accepted into uh, General Assembly's UX immersive program. However, I've had conversations with a few UX researchers and designers in real life, and many of them have said I don't really need to do the boot camp in order to build a portfolio or even to get a foot in the door, given my educational slash professional background. I'm wary of that piece of advice because these people have master's degrees in HCI or industrial design. Hey, uh, here's my background: master's in sociology. Uh, I have training in research methods. Uh, I'm skimming here. Six years of professional research experience in digital marketing slash advertising analytics. Uh, experience with front-end development. I'm pretty good with design tools like Photoshop and Illustrator. Uh, and they go on to say, ideally, I'd want to be in a more research-focused role, which plays well with my background anyway. Right now, I have a couple of op options. Go do UXDI and utilize the network and career resources of General Assembly. Do a HCI certificate program instead from a local university that is known for their HCI program. Um, and the last one is F it, do none of the above, learn on my own, build the portfolio and hope for the best. What would you do? So Blake, UX uh. boot camps. So loaded. Um, this one's kind of interesting because I wouldn't have expected somebody with this much experience to be having this question. Um, uh, what I would say is you hit on exactly the only reason I would go through this in your case, which is for the connections that can possibly give you. Right. But it sounds like that you've obviously already been talking to designers and that you you have some good experience, especially if you just want to go into re like UX research specifically. Cause I mean, if you've had this much experience, you say like six years in digital marketing and advertising analytics plus client facing experience, that's enough to probably get you in the door. And if you've been teaching yourself or somehow figured out how to do front end development on your own, plus you know how to use some of the prototyping tools, man, I would put together a portfolio on your own and save yourself the money that's because uh, yeah. I know GA can be super expensive. Um, if you if you have the time and the resources, can't hurt to get an HCI certificate. Um, but I don't know that it's absolutely necessary. I think between the people you already know, talking to them and having them review your portfolio as you build it, uh, plus just being like research focused as you are already, I, th I think you gotta can get your foot in the door pretty easily. I'm surprised, Blake. You didn't plug any meetups. I think that that might be more valuable to you if you're looking for just those connections, right? And those oftentimes are free. So you may be able to, uh, you know, get away with those, that networking cap uh, opportunity uh, at those meetups instead of going to a UX bootcamp. And honestly, a lot of the people at UX bootcamp are people who sort of need assistance with their, uh, with their portfolio building. Right. And so, or if you're like completely switching careers, but it sounds too. like this guy has a lot of like yeah, relevant deep roots in the analysis portion of what like UX research would do. Right. Yeah. Relevant background experience. So yeah, I I say don't do it. Um, maybe do the HCI stuff, but yeah, if you're, I I would go with option three. F it. Do none of the above. Learn on my own. Build the portfolio and hope for the best. Um, and attend meetups. I'll just add that to it. <laughs> and you should be good to go. <laughs> Sounds like a winning combination for sure. All right. Uh, do you have anything else or should I close this out? Let's close this sucker out. Let's get out of here. All right. That's it for today, everyone. Let us know what you guys think of the stories this week. Did you like them? Hate them? Let us know. Uh, also, if you want to write in to us and let us know any topics that you think we may have missed or news stories, uh, you know, all that stuff. You can follow us all over social media. Head on over to the Human Factors Cast LinkedIn, Facebook, or Twitter at H Factors Podcast. You can join the discussion on our SoundCloud or send us an email at humanfactorscast at gmail.com. If you're feeling saucy, leave us a voicemail at 901 646 1432. That's 901 646 1 HFC. HFC, short for Human Factors Cast, if you haven't figured it out already. All right, you can also support us on our Patreon at patreon.com slash humanfactorscast. One of the rewards for that coming up soon is going to be joining us on a custom Slack channel where you can chat with us 24-7. Be sure to like, subscribe, review us on Apple Podcasts, the Google Play Store, or your favorite podcast directory. And of course, you can always reach us on our home of the web, humanfactorscast.com. Mr. Blake Arnstorf, uh, what did I call you at the very beginning? Caretaker. <laughs> Thanks for, Thanks for hanging out with me on the show today. Where can our listeners find you if they want to X 
ask you any questions about UX, psychology, design, whatever it is. Of course, you guys can ask me about anything that Nick mentioned and hot dog banter at Don't Panic UX. Get anybody talking about hot dogs with you? Uh, unfortunately not. I thought that some people would jump on that, but not recently. Ah, go talk with Blake about hot dogs. As for me, I've been your host, Nick Rome. You can find me on LinkedIn or Twitter at Nick underscore Rome. Thanks again for tuning in to Human Factors Cast. Until next time, what is it, Blake? Uh, it depends. It depends. Robots, caretakers, Star Wars toys. Got anything? Uh, no to UX cert programs. No UX cert program. Show the process. Portfolio. 3.5.